together as your children and as uh, your servants, we thank you for the opportunity that uh, we have to know you, to understand who you are in the depth of your word. Thank you for the provisions you gave throughout the week. Thank you for bringing Mariah here today. And we thank you for all that you uh, continue to provide for us in our, our physical, financial, emotional, spiritual health that we need, um, our mental state of mind, our entire being. We thank you for that you continue to guide and direct us as we uh, have so much of, of things that we need. And we know that you are always there for us, already decreeing before us what you have us to experience and which as we walk therein, your provisions and your restoration and your refreshing opportunities you give to us. We thank you for the continuing to look into this uh, scriptures of the first and second Thessalonians as we look now into the writings of Paul that you gave him the inspired understandings to write to these folks and to help us to understand how it applies to us and their environment, what was practically the way they were going through and how it relates to us and the things were involving prophetic things out ahead. So Father, we thank you for all that you continue to do teach and help us to understand, edify us and correct us and encourage us in our spirit. So uh, again, be with us, Father, now as our counselor, our teacher, our pastor, our, our shepherd, our guide, our counselor, and everything that we say and do today. We ask that uh, the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. We ask all this in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, today's going to be our study on Second Thessalonians chapter 3, but um, we're going to take a little bit of a more of a cursory background uh, in lieu of the consideration of Mariah coming in new. I don't want you to get off, if we just started on, we're on the end, this is our last study of two epistles, <laughs> of which Friday will be a conclusionary type of study, but uh, to wrap everything up. But today's the study of the last chapter, but it, it's actually interesting that you're here today as, and that sense of it. So we'll go through some uh, summary of what we talked about. And just to remind you, which is interesting, you'll probably appeal to this, and <laughs> it's God's fate, right? It's just, it's not coincidences. But in Thessalonians, what was going on is the Apostle Paul back in the day, around AD 50, uh, he's coming in. I wrote on the board before. Uh, so AD 51 is when uh, the actual, uh, actually, he wrote this from Corinth. I put his erase on the board, but he wrote this letter from Corinth, AD 51. And five years before that was the writings of Matthew recording Jesus' Olivet Discourse, which was in Christianity the most powerful prophetic teaching like ever. And people forget when that was done. So you had Hosanna, Palm Sunday, Followed by two days later, he's teaching for two days the all of a discourse, which is the most profound, ridiculously, still confusing today, still misunderstood today, prophetic teachings of Christ himself. And yet, and after that, then he had his Passover and then he was crucified. And so people go, whoa, so he taught his most profound teaching the last two days of his full days of his ministry. And people don't really put that together. So that was then, if you were not, if you were there, then you heard it. Five years later, um, excuse me, so 30, 83, 83, 80, 33, he passes away, he dies, and comes back to life again. But then all of a sudden, 13 years after that, then Matthew writes about it. So if you, weren't, if you were there, then you heard it. But if you weren't there, you wouldn't understand unless it was passed on to you by verbal. But then later on, Matthew writes it as the Holy Spirit tells him. And then 80, 46, now you're reading about it, going, what? He, he said what? He taught what? And so then there, that's, that's a new, fresh thought to a depth of understanding. Yes, sorry. We have, inter we have interaction, by the way, in our study. Yes. We also have T. Terrell. That's Terrell. Terrell's Darrell's brother. Hey, Terrell. Uh, Darrell and Terrell are, are both in Georgia. Uh, they're brothers, twins. <laughs> you can oh, tell by their names, okay. one letter difference. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Terrell. And we have Darrell as well. So. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So they're brothers. Thank you. Yep. So we'll see you guys. So uh, the re the reality is that um, they can. I can't see them, obviously, but they can see us. So. Um, so in, in reference to what was going on in, in, in that time, so if you were there at the prophetic Olivet of a discourse, you heard the lesson yourself, you didn't understand it, nobody did, and they understood at best a surface level understanding. But then later on, the apostles were empowered by the Holy Spirit, they began to understand, and it wasn't until 13 years after his resurrection that Matthew then pens the, the record of what was spoken, and so then people start to really kind of understand more of what was being said from those who were there and from those who now are here for the first time. Now, 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians, excuse, both of them, were books or written, were the first ones written about prophetic things before John wrote Revelation. Because John wrote Revelation in 80, about 100, 80, 80, so there you have a good number of years before that. But this is the first book written that was not recording the direct teachings of Christ, but the teachings of Christ through a man, that now Paul is teaching. So that's what makes 1st, 2nd Thessalonians pretty profound stuff. And however, with that being said, he's writing to a people who were, who were in the Gentile world 
of we're doing pagan worship. They were doing polytheistic things. They were doing all kinds of different things, worshiping different statues and sticks and stones and whatnot. And so I'm just saying that as, as tongue in cheek. But then he, they, they, they were genuinely um, believed in Christ. And he was teaching them what scripture would call mysteries or the level of the word of God with some depth into it. That taught about not just Christ being God Almighty, God died, dying for your sins, and the person of God the Son, and all of that. They heard that. The Jews heard that. They were both like, whoa. But then he built on that a whole lot more. And the Jews were going, what are, you, what are you talking about? And he was talking about how the inheritance is there's different salvations, plural. There's a salvation in Christ that is the essential. And then there's other salvations he provides in him to prevent yourself from being in bad place at his day of, he calls his Bema seat or his judgment day. So many people think that a judgment day, for those in Christ, they think, oh, but you're going to get, uh, you know, declared innocent. Well, yeah, you're innocent of your sin, of your sin of death unto him. Yeah, but you still have accountabilities and responsibilities to, to live in a way that is worthy of showing appreciation and gratitude. You don't lose your relationship with Christ, but you do not enjoy the relationship with Christ if you don't obey and submit and collaborate with him now. That's the whole purpose of judgment. People think it's about saying you're guilty or not guilty. No. Him infusing in you the belief of who he is, which, um, based on what you were saying to me, for example, I might use I'm going to use an example, but um, there's a guy also named Bart Erdman, if you heard of him or not. He does these Jesus seminars, and he was raised in a, in a Methodist uh, upbringing, and he gives a in his one of his books, uh, he's around, he's now a professed atheist type of guy, doesn't believe in anything, right? But he was raised in a Methodist church. He gives a, a testimony about himself, and he gives his born again experience. He writes about it, and one of his introductions of his books, I can't remember the name of the book, but I read it myself. And I was amazed, like he was just going through the literal, factual, honest, genuine experience. Okay, and then he went to seminary at Moody Bible Institute in Illinois. And then he went started seminary, he started asking questions about, hey, these Matthew, Mark, and Luke things don't match up, and you guys are calling them the teachers, the professors, the seminary, the Christianity, what I call churchianity. They were calling it Subnoptic, which is a fancy way of saying they're all saying the same thing different ways. And he was going, but that doesn't make sense in everything. Sometimes I, I get what you're saying, but it doesn't make sense because you're saying he fed the fishes and loaves one time, but there's 5,000 here and there's 4,000 there, and then there's seven, and then there's two fish. Say, something's not right. You're not, something's not right. And so he would ask questions and say, hey, this doesn't match up. And then they said, no, that stop questioning what we know to be true. And he thought, okay. So now you're telling me I can't question the details of God's word because now I'm, I'm becoming sacrilegious? So, and so he started to realize they're trying to hide something. What don't, what don't they know? What are they afraid of? If it's true, then truth shouldn't be afraid, afraid of a challenge. Truth should embrace a challenge and say, yeah, sure, vet the truth because the truth will always set you free. Truth is always true, right? So he, his mindset was kind of like Charles Darwin-esque. Same thing with Darwin. He started off with the right mindset. The Catholic Church didn't have answers, so he went on his own answer and his own thing. He went off the rails. But it doesn't mean that he was not still a believer at, when he first started off. He just went off the rails. Same with Bart Erdman. So I'm saying, probably same with you. It's not because, it's, it's not because that you were this evil human being, just like Darwin and, and, and Bart Erdman. It's just that without the proper um, people, like Jesus said in the book of Hosea, like people like priests. If you don't have the right, if you, have a, if you, are, if you are raised up in an abusive, exploitative, violent environment, like I was, then you're, going, you're not going to have the ability to know what true parenting and love looks like. So all you have to do is simply go, well, then either I can emulate what I, what I saw, I can fight and be frustrated with what I saw and became, or I can turn to God and give it over to him and have him teach me, equip me, love me, and, and, and be my father and, and be the one who restores and refreshes me and gives me a new understanding. So that just means that all along, the scripture would technically call a person who starts off in that understanding of belief, but once it goes off the rails, I'm going to say it nicely, then we've all been there. <laughs> but then the reality is that he's just saying, hey, you're just a child who went wayward, like the scripture of the prodigal son. So I'll say that to say this, to take segue into our, our, our freshening of our study. The prodigal son story, for example, when I say churchianity, what I mean by that is Christianity as a whole has taken the stories of scripture, and no, I'm using this word properly, they've bastardized them to make them into something that fits their narrative. And their narrative is it's this or it's that. It's black or it's white. For example, to your point, um, what if I were to uh, introduce you to something that is way off, it's, not, it's way far advanced for you to understand now, but you said before about hell. Uh, so hell is a word that man makes up for the Greek word Hades, for the Hebrew word Sheol, which in, in fact is a place of abode of the dead known as in the Old Testament in, in Hebrew, 
the New Testament, known as the place for same thing. But now we see it more come into picturesque understanding in Luke 16 when this rich man Lazarus died. And when they're there, the one who's in the fiery torment, he, he says, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't write the book. He said, uh, Father Abraham. He wouldn't know who he was. Nor would he call him Father Abraham unless he was, guess what? A Jew. And so you go, wait a second here. What is a Jew doing in this fiery torment? And so you start to get ideas about what this is all about. And that's just one of many things that kind of get you to say, wait a second here. And he starts talking about having his brothers not want to go there and having his, his tongue was, was just was, he's tormented, have water on his tongue. And, and, the, and then, of course, the response was, if they don't have to believe in Moses and the writings of Moses, why would they believe in someone risen from the, from the dead? Which puts a large emphasis on saying God's word matters more than the supernatural signs, wonders, visions, and all this stuff. Because that's what, no offense, our charismatic Pentecostal friends want to go, hey, this is what matters. And that scripture makes it really clear. You can't get any more dramatic than raising someone from the dead. That's pretty dramatic. And he's saying, so what? They're not going to believe that. They don't believe the writings, just words on a page of Moses. What? So it really puts you to this high value that God's putting on his word, which is what Jesus did when he was tempted. He didn't say, I felt, I experienced, or I remembered, or I, I imagined. He said, no, it is written, it is written, it is written. Each time he was tempted, the word of God, the living word of God, used the written word of God to refute the the those falsehoods. So that just kind of goes to the Hades experience of, of torment or of judgment or of fiery, fiery things is <laughs> actually for people who are in Christ who say, I could care less of being obedient to you, God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't want to do that. Because if you do that, we're going to actually mention that today. I didn't, it's, just, it's ironic that you're here today, of all days, that we're in chapter 3, and chapter 3 is a closeout of all this, prof he, 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 he builds up these people and gets in this prophetic talk conversation, but he ends with this practical sense of, what do you do with all this? And he talks about not living disorderly or unruly, or well, the word in the Greek is atakos, and it just means to be, don't be out of place. In other words, I would be out of place, if you came in here today, didn't know me, which you don't, right? I've never met you before in my life. But if you came in here today and I started uh, doing some witchcraft stuff up here, you'd be going, what the heck is he doing? That's why I'm here to not do that. Yeah. That's out of place, right? So something out of place would be out of behavior, out of character, out of the realm of what is expected and what is defined by what God would call sanctification and righteousness, reconciliation to the peace of who he is, what his truth is, says and who he is. So that's what he means by being out of place. People weren't, weren't measuring up to uh, that. And there's an old... Uh, relevance to, I was making fun on the way here, we, we were seeing a Wendy's drive through guy bringing um, food to the car that was parked. And I'm thinking, you know what, I should drive through the drive through just for fun and say, y'all need to change your name or change your conduct because it's no longer a drive through It's a drive and park through. Because I'm not, I'm not actually driving through anymore, I'm driving and I'm parking. So you should change your name or change the conduct because it's no longer me go to the window, get my food and go. Even though I don't do that anymore, we've done that once maybe in three months through a fast food uh, drive through and usually it's Chick-fil-A when I do it. <laughs> but, but the reality is it's just one of those things where they, they make you drive and park now. And part of that's COVID and part of that's just because they're inundated, whatever. But just a tongue in cheek, funny, haha. So my whole point is people that say, I believe in Christ, I'm not questioning that. What I'm questioning is, okay, then act like it. Then, then, then they have a behavior that regardless of where, what you say, you know this much or you know this much is irrelevant to God. And, the, and in the sense that what you do know, you should be doing. That's the point. So people up here want to admit, don't want to condescend people down here, and people down here want to say they're 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 hypocrites. You know, we're all hypocrites, man. Join the crowd. And so the reality is, none of us live the way we should. And Paul talks about that in Romans seven: the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. That's the Apostle Paul, the great of, of sinners in Christ. He was the greatest of all of us, and uh, well. John the Baptist was greater than him, but he, from writing the scriptures, and he said, look, I, I can't do what I can't do. Even John the Baptist was, was put in prison, and he said, is he the one? I just want to make sure that I got the right one. Is he the one, or is there another? And Jesus said, just tell him that everything's fine, that, that I am the one. And so people forget to mention that Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest ever born of a woman. You forget about the Apostle Paul, who wrote a third of the New Testament, and these two men were, were not perfect. They had issues, and you had great women in the Bible, too. And women are, are upheld in, in high esteem as well. And Paul, for example, being this highly astute man, charged Phoebe in the book of Romans to be a deaconess. 
which many people in Christendom and Christianity reject that a female should have any type of authority or uh, teaching in, in Christianity, and that is completely wrong. She can teach all day long. A woman can all day long. Phoebe did that. Priscilla and Aquila did that. And so, yeah, there are opportunities for that to happen. The only thing a woman can do in, in the Christianity aspect is be a pastor. And it isn't because she's not qualified, because she is. <laughs> the only reason that God says not to do that is the same reason why she's qualified to lead a household. It's just that in a dance, someone has to lead, and God gave that to the man. Not because he's more deserving or more superior. That's totally not true. It's just the way God put the government in place. That's all it is. That's all it is. And man should realize that and not condescend a woman, but just say, you know, we're equal. It's just that my position is different. And I should appreciate, you know, the fact that I'm put in charge of this. But yet, not to get off, the, off track a little bit, but let's just say, for example, in the Garden of Eden, uh, I, I, we can, we've studied this before, but a woman was made more superior to man. And so the, you don't hear that in Christianity, right? It's always women is inferior to man. That's not true. Post-sin, yes. Post-sin, the woman is treated as the, as the weaker vessel. But pre-sin, women was the superior one to, to man, which is why Satan came after her, not him. People don't think about that. Satan doesn't go after He didn't go after the apostles, did he? He went after Jesus first, right, right away. He didn't go after his followers. He went after him right away. Boom. As soon as he got baptized, he went after him. He was all about going after him. So that's what he wanted. The head of the snake, he wants to cut off the head. And then all those, that's what he said, the shepherd's stricken and the sheep will scatter. So anyway. So I digress. So in the book of 2 Thessalonians is a, is a parlay unto 1 Thessalonians. And what he said in the book of Acts 17 is he had taught them for three months in the Jewish community. And then he went into taught the Gentiles as well. And some of these people, there were three kinds of people involved in, in his, his writings. There's Jewish people who came to believe in Christ as Savior. There's Jewish people that didn't believe in Christ as Savior. So those, we call, those, those are called in Scripture people of covenant. So they had the covenant of the house of Moses which they were following the law of Moses and the different decrees that were passed on for 2,000 years. And to their mindset, how could that be wrong? Then there's those in, 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 in Jewish uh, relationship that said, you know, I see that this is no longer needed. It's in Christ that matters, and I see he fulfilled everything. And as the Melchizedek priesthood, he fulfilled the Aaronic priesthood sacrifices, but as the Melchizedek priesthood, he is superior in all ways. He is permanent. He is eternal. He is heavenly. This is temporary. Aaronic it is earthly. It is for man. Two different things. And so they saw him as superior, and they realized that. And they said, you know, he, he's our Savior. He's the Messiah. And so then there was another group of people, which was the dominant group of people in Thessalonians, which were Gentiles, who worshipped, again, all these different things and a lot of influence. What's interesting is under the Roman Empire back in the day, there was no governor or procurator or ruler over that area. They were kind of ruled from afar. So Rome was over Thessalonica, but it was such where it was pretty much a, a tamed area. It was a nice commerce. They were always in and out of there doing commerce and mercantile type trading. They didn't have a need to put a, a ruler there because it was always pretty much calm and tame. However, once Paul came there and talked about Christ and the depth of teaching of the mysteries, he calls it, these Gentiles were just so involved in supernatural things and sensationalism of things. They, they knew that that was, like you said, the best. You said, yeah, you know that that stuff can lead that validates that there's spiritual forces out there. But you just, but you all of a sudden now you realize the true force behind it all is God himself. Well, I want I want this. Well, then they were just more engulfed in it and, and wanting to hear more of the truth. And so Paul writes to them again in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5, and he says, do you not remember what I taught you? As if to remind them that he already taught them things that he's now going back again and re-verifying or re-confirming re, re and, and firming them up. I, I picture it as a word picture of when you're digging a hole to put a beam in, and, and you put, dig the hole, you put the beam in, it's in there, but it's still, it's still not stable. And you have to dip, pull the dirt in there and the concrete in there, and then it becomes firm. And that's what he's doing right in these letters. He's already dug the hole of truth. He's already planted them in that hole of understanding. He's like, hey, you got it? They go, I got it, but I'm not, I'm not like you, Paul. I, don't, I, don't under, I can't like repeat it back to you or something like that. I can't like teach somebody. I, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of scattered a little bit. I'm generally understanding it, but I don't have what Scripture would call a dianea understanding, which is a generalistic understanding. I don't have a sunemi understanding, which is detail. So it's kind of like saying I do understand about aerodynamics and the fact that a plane a jet whatnot has different things that keep it off the ground, but if you would ask me to actually diagram it and fix a plane or, or make one, I can't do that, nor can I fly one, nor can I really explain to you aerodynamics in detail. I don't understand that. I just know the general idea <laughs> that, that there's jets on the side, there's a pilot in the cockpit, and we fly in the air and we land. I get it. But, but I don't understand how all of it works. I mean, detail, I can't like, teach a class. 
So that's kind of what he's talking about when he says Dionysian understanding, general versus detail. So their letters of the first, second, second Thessalonians were to do that, to build detail. So what he starts off with, he starts off in, in First Thessalonians, and he gives this whole big, big crescendo about comparing those who are maturing in their faith with those that are not maturing in their faith. And Christianity says, well, there's, there's all these people in Thessalonians that are all just newbies in, in, in Christ. They don't know nothing. They're, they're, they're kind of newbies. They're struggling. They're, and they're just not, they're not right with their walk with God. And so Paul's trying to get them from, from what we would call milk to meat. And that's not really true at all. What happens is, is that just like in life, there's different tiers of your growth, right? You go from what the scripture, this is all uh, words that we use in a uh, chart that I took right from the scripture, and the words are the Greek words for the growth cycle of our physical being, which are the words are brephos, which is a baby inside the womb or outside the womb that is totally helpless and needs 100% support from another human being or else the baby dies. That's a brephos. Then there's a nepios, which is a baby that crawls, then there's a micros, which is when you try to walk, but you keep falling on your butt because you can't have the strength yet to fully walk, which you've, we've all seen this. We've all done this. And then there's the, the pation, which is the terrible twos, we call it. It's a two-year-old enough who's now walking around free. And then the technon becomes individual thinking, teenager. <laughs> and then there's the naniscos, which is young adult. And then there's anir, which is adult. And so these are the steps of our physical growth. Well, that works in our spiritual life. However, this happens twice in our spiritual life. So we go from brephos and epios being of covenant, knowing that there's one true God and that's all there is. There's not three and four and five and two. There's one God. That's it. It just so happens in Scripture, he, not, not me, he introduces himself as Elohim. I, that's his name. I didn't. So Elohim, why would you say that? Well, El, Elah, Eloha means God. Why would he say Im? Because Im in Hebrew is plural. Okay. So he used that. I, okay. And then he said, let us make, okay, who's us? And then you find out later on in Deuteronomy 6.4, the Jewish Shema, which they repeat as teenagers, hear, O Israel, the Yahweh, our Elohim, is one Yahweh. Like, wait a second. Yahweh is the authoritative existent name for God. Elohim is the plural creator name for God. You're saying the authoritative existent plural creator is one. <laughs> Interesting. And yet Jews say this and yet reject this, which is kind of ironic. It's just God's way of, again, indicting them with saying, hey, this is, <laughs> you have eyes to see, but you do not see. You have ears to hear, but you do not hear. And some of it, again, is on them who have been made aware. In other words, he just says, look, I made you. In his view, you're made blind and deaf. In your view, you've given chances, and you just continue to reject. So there's, there's that kind of concept of what's going on. But in 1 Thessalonians, he, he gives this contrast in that growth cycle. So, they, so those people that grow and grow in the testament and they get in micros is when you're in, in Christ, you're in testament because now a covenant shed by blood becomes a testament. That blood is the blood of Christ, which is where we get our legal terms, your last will and testament. Because when your will is written in a legal doc and then you die, that will has been ratified by your blood and it can't be changed. Now the courts can deliberate all they want what you intended to mean. That's why Christ said nothing can add or take away from my word because his will's been ratified by his blood. The whole book's done. There's no more additional things being spoken of to our Mormon friends. No. To our Jehovah's Witness friends. No. You can't add. It's done. The last will and testament is his last will and it's been ratified by his blood on the cross. It's over. Now after that he gave these people to write about what happened. He said these are the ones that were confirmed by the signs and wonders they had that's how you know these are the ones I've confirmed to write about what's happened. And when they're dead and gone, that's it. There's no more apostles after that. They're done, right? So with that, with that being spoken about, there's these different aspects of how 1 Thessalonians is this contrast of the second tier of growth. So these people grew like weeds from not knowing who Christ was to knowing who Christ was, growing up to a mature person of who Christ, who Christ was as far as in understanding God's word is, is, I mean, like they knew the depth of understanding the language of that they had to know Hebrew and understand that what the, he's talking about. They didn't understand it all, but they knew that was important. They understand that they, the prophetic aspects that Christ is coming again to set up a kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. They heard about that. They're like, this is pretty awesome stuff. And they heard about how we're going to be accountable before God, that God in Christ died for our sins. And they knew all these different basic things about confession, repentance, sanctification, all this. But then Paul's teaching them these mysteries about, hey, there's more than one salvation, there's salvation, there's more than one inheritance, there's of earth and there's of heaven. There's, there's more than one wedding feast. There's, there's, a, there's a duality of that. There's an Ariston first feast, and there's a Dipnot second feast. 
So you're like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? And, he, and then the Jews were hearing this and going, wait a second. Okay, first of all, you want us to believe that these people who are, who are polytheistic people, and we were monotheistic. Now, it's one thing to swallow the pill that we're the, we're the same, we're one new man in Christ. And now you're telling me that not only are we the same, but they have privy to things that not even we had privy to. That doesn't make sense to me as a Jew being raised 2,000 years with being told, I'm superior, I'm superior, I'm superior, I'm superior. God works and, and talks through me and my people. And all of a sudden, you're taking these other people and making them equal to me, and also you're saying they have privy to things that you didn't even give us. He's going, yeah, you got it right. <laughs> okay, I have an issue with that. In your pride and your arrogance, you don't like that. It doesn't sound right. But that's what God was saying. And so the people in Thessalonica were having this division issue of immaturity, and maturity of those who were walking in faith. So you had people that were, to put it simply, they were immature, they were foolish people, which means they were doing things that they should know not to do, but they were doing them anyways. And then there were those that were just disobedient. These are all people in Christ that he's talking about in contrast to who he's writing about. So in the book of 1 Thessalonians, he ends with this whole aspect of what people call a rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, but it's not. He says it, it, the coming of the Lord, which is the presence, the parousia, which is his physical manifestation on this world. And he had that when he first came in his first ministry, and he'll do that again. Well, with that being said, what happened is in that sense of it, we all know that in, in that sense of it, in 1 Thessalonians 4, people say that's a rapture passage, but he's not talking about a rapture. He's talking about the perusia, which is the ending of a seven-year tribulation, from which he's saying, hey, don't worry about things, because if you are here for that seven-year period, just know that if you're alive and remain, if you're ones who are, if you were living for what was the, the, the truth of pursuing God, but you just weren't mature enough yet, that's okay. You have another chance to, to be taken out of this, this place. And, but th even if you are that, there's a second half promise as well. Then he ends with the word rapture or catching up at the end of tribulation period leading into the millennial reign, which that's where the word rapture appears, which ironically happens at the end of tribulation, not at the beginning of tribulation which is what church Santa doesn't understand, all because they don't look at the details, and they just gloss over words, and they focus on English. So what we saw was the English words don't give you ability to understand the truth. You did, they just can't, because it wasn't written in English. It was written in the Old Semitic Hebrew and the Koine Greek. So when you say, what does that mean? Just a, a dovetail on that is that there's 2,700 words in Hebrew you can't put to English, and there's 2,500 words in Koine Greek you can't put to English. You need phrases or sentences to do so. Which means I always joke with people and say, and they go, I can read the King James and be just fine. No, okay. But if you do just that, then you have about over 5,000 reasons you might be wrong. You might be reading something that you don't understand the depth of it. So you have a right concept, but you miss the detail and you could be off on a, on a different uh, conclusion because your premise is wrong. Because you misunderstood what the premise was. And we're going to find, we've already seen a lot of that already. So in 2 Thessalonians, he ends with 1 Thessalonians talking about that, that piece of it, about how he's lauding them, about how much they mean to him, Paul that is, and Silas and Timothy, and how much uh, they mean to him, how much he, he, they mean to him and he means to them. And then he talks about in chapter 3 about establishing them, firming them up. Well, he ends with this prophetic aspect in chapter 4 and 5. He goes into more of that in chapter uh, 1 and 2 of 2 Thessalonians. And we talked about how he, he mentions, he says, listen, he's basically saying through the first two epistles, people are around you trying to, since they, they know that you're already uh, kind of jazzed up for the sensationalism or for the spirituality because you've been so involved in, it in the pagan side. So they're going to, Satan's going to use that to, to exploit you. He, he, he just does. He's, he's not stupid. And he talks about how brilliant Satan is, and he's going to take what our inclinations are. Toward, and he talks about that toward the pagan people and toward those who are maturing in Christ. He says either one, because when you're maturing in Christ, you realize there's more than what's on the page. You realize there's a depth of Scripture. There's, a, there's a, what Scripture calls truth within truth. And you start to realize, and the more you realize that, the more you realize you can't trust what you hear. You can't trust what you see in anything in life. And then all of a sudden, because of that, people, Satan will go, <laughs> he'll use that against you to present falsehoods and lies to get you down a path to get you off the, the, the truth. And you say, well, how do I know what's right and what's wrong? It's very really easy, actually. If it leads you back to Scripture, and it leads you back to studying this book, and, and knowing about the, our, our God and our Lord, then it's good. If it doesn't, run away from it. Stay away from it. Put it aside you. It is not good. If it takes you down this fanciful thought of this or that about your life, but it doesn't lead you back to studying or falling in love with the, the, the living Word of God, and want to study the written Word of God, 
then it's not good. It's not good. It never is. I don't care how much it makes you feel good. And, but my family is better by this, and the food came in my house. It, it doesn't matter. It's all just misdirection to confuse you and to and to what Satan does. He, he uses good to accomplish his evil ways. And those are things we saw earlier that Satan is as a, he's a Diabolos uh, character trait, which is a tempter to people that believe in Christ. That as you grow to what he calls the mysteries, he then shows himself as Satanus. That's his technical, technical name, not Satan, but Satanus. And that's his name for when he's a deceiver. So he's a tempter, which you can see coming. If you're living in the right way, living by faith, then you know what temptation looks like, right? And sometimes you don't, but most time you probably should and could and would. But one thing is for sure, after you've been tempted and you go back and repent and get restored, you can then see what it is for what it was. As a deceiver, that's diabolos. That's the word for devil. When he's Satan, Satanus, he comes at you as deceiver. These are all in the scripture. In Luke 8, he talks about diabolos and the parable of the sower and the seed. In Mark 4, he talks about Satanus. This is where he attacks you when you get the mysteries. He attacks you with deception. Deception like, oh, come on, you know enough. Look at everybody else. You already know more than them. Just relax. Come on. You know, don't worry about moving forward. Because all he wants to do as Satanus is deceive you to thinking because you are been given a different level of, of blessing from God, relax, stop striving, stop agonizing, stop fighting to the end of this good fight that Paul says not to do. Paul says to fight to the very end, to fight with your last breath, to, to please God. Philippians said it about Christ himself, faithful unto death. Satan wants you to be, he has to lie to you and deceive you and say, hey, look, do the comparison game. Do the how I feel game. Do the how I think game. Do the sensationalism game. But don't do the compare yourself to Christ game. I don't like that because then you'll see who you really are. You'll see that you don't measure up. You'll see that there's always a constant striving. There's never an arrival, ever. You constantly strive and strive and strive. And on this way of being refreshed and restored, and you righteous man falls six times, but he gets up seven. So you're going you're gonna to experience failures. There's no doubt about it. But on your path to success, keep your view. Keep your vantage point. So that's what this whole book's about. So he gets to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he talks about how he goes, look, guys, I just want you to know that when we're gathered in, into this wedding feast, it's not for everybody. So it's a privilege. It's like saying, I mentioned it before, it's like you may know people that have gotten married before that didn't invite you to the wedding. I know family members who have gotten married didn't invite me. Truth. <laughs> they didn't invite me for different reasons. Uh, by the way, I get family of 13, just so you know. And like I mentioned before, it's exploitative and abusive and, and, and violent. But so when that happens, that's a, that's a similitude of a small scale of what it would mean like for those who be in Christ that aren't invited to the wedding feast. Because Christianity says we're all invited. Not true. Only certain groups are invited. Only a certain small percent. I would say percentage-wise, it's less than 20%. And I'm being very generous. That are invited. And then those who are invited have to then be found worthy to retain the ability to not just be entering the Ariston, which is the early feast, then to actually enter into the second feast, the Dipnon, which is when you have your inheritance in the heavens. So just like in done to the angels, People, don't forget, you forget this. Satan made merchandise, it says in the book of Ezekiel. He made merchandise of the angels in heaven, which means he transacted a business deal with them. He basically gave them the ability, like the old Milton, uh, what is it, uh, Milton's book about serving in hell is better than, ruling in hell is better than serving in heaven type of thing. And they bought into this garbage. And they're like, okay, let's go. Like, hey, wait a second. No one bothers to ask the question, how can you deceive an angelic celestial being who supposedly cannot fall from this celestial state. He himself fell from being anointed cherub that covereth to now being fallen. So why does that surprise you that he being the chief celestial being can't take other celestial beings and have them follow with? Why is that so shocking? But it's in the Bible. People read about it and they ignore the fact that that happened. But it happened twice. It happened originally when he took all the angelic hosts down and they made the earth into a voided place, which you will forget about Genesis. Genesis was a place where God created everything beautiful, and God said in Isaiah 45, he did not make it void. It became that way, haya, a moving verb, which means it was something and it became something else. Like Lot's wife was not a pillar of salt. She became a pillar of salt. Same word, haya means a moving verb. So it became void. So Satan and his angelic host, they did that. Like, wait a minute. And then God flooded the earth twice. He flooded it then, and he flooded it later on with Noah when man was here. So people misunderstand this. And that's why 2 Peter says man's willfully ignorant about the flood of the world that then was and now. There's two floods. And somebody said to me once, well, how do you see that in Genesis? 
<laughs> Read verse 2, man. Where the Spirit hovered over, hovered over the what? The mountains? The flowers? The trees? No. The deep. The earth was covered in water. How did he get that way? God didn't make it that way. God said straightforward, I made it to be inhabited. You can't inhabit something that's covered with water, I'm just saying. You're not Aquaman. You're not fish. He's talking about living. And so therefore, Satan was cast here. He ruined the whole place. His angelic host ruined it with him. Then you have in Revelation these four chief angels from the river Euphrates that come up, which ironically match up to the four kingdoms later on that were to come against Christ, Babylonian, Medes and Persian, Greek, and Roman, which coincidentally, Daniel sees the image, and a rock comes and then pulverizes it. And then God later tells you, and then Michael tells you, Michael the archangel said, I would come to you earlier, but I was buffeted by the prince of Persia. So there's these angelic demonic de demons who are overseeing each of these chief kingdoms which is why there's four kingdoms and there's four chief angels from the river Euphrates in Revelation. It's not funny, and they're very severe. That's why there's also angels in Tartarus in 2 Peter chapter 2, whereas there's other angels in Jude in gloom of darkness, which are the ones from Genesis 6. So the ones in 2 Peter were from Genesis 1, and the one from, the one from Jude are the ones that left their first estate, and they raped women, and they created hybrid offsprings. Like, it's insane. And so that's all that, so all this is things that aren't taught in regular Christianity, but these are things that go into kind of revealing more of Satan's hand and his plan about how he always has a little, just like Christ, he likes to mock and counterfeit Christ all day long. So Christ always is about a remnant. But <laughs> Satan's like, I have that too. So he can, God can purify and, and sanctify, and he always has a remnant of evil. Just like in the ark, people forget the ark, the Noah's ark. God purged the earth of the, of the hybrid offspring, and he purged the earth of all these different, and eight people survived. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. That's eight people. Then animals, about 10,000 species, about 30,000 of them, roughly. Okay, so they're on the ark. They all survived. They come off. People say, okay, um, how did giants in the land come again? What's that about? Well, you read Nimrod, and his name is a nef, nef, Rephium, which is the same word used of a giant. You're saying, well, how did he... <laughs> Just like one generation later, there's a giant already existing. Like, this happened pretty quick. Like, what's that about? Well, I thought God eradicated that off the planet. Well, no, because God was not joking around when he said the wheat and the tares parable was a foreshadowing that happened before, which is Nama, which came from Cain's line, which is also a seed of Satan. He came in. Nama was a hybrid, and she was married into Ham, and Ham was on the ark, and Noah was like, oh, great, y'all are married. You're husband and wife. I can't divide you. That's not, you can't do that. You're one flesh. Well, great. Now they had propagation later on, which produced this hybrid offspring of this giant line. That's how Nimrod came out. So Satan's just laughing his butt off, going, okay, fine. Fine, 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 fine. You can, you can destroy all the giants that you want. I still got my seed on the ark. <laughs> I got Nama, which Nama, coincidentally, is a city in Canaan later on that was told by God, by the Israelites, take and kill all the giants in that land. Take them out. That's your land to be possessed. And yet Nama was a capital of that city. What a coincidence. So it's a very poignant thing to kind of you miss these things but they're in there in the scripture so but they're just so and first thessalonians he covers a lot of details like this he goes to second thessalonians about the prophetic aspect and he talks about how don't let people confuse you in chapter two about the coming of of, of the lord and about our, our our gathering to him so you okay babe yes okay sorry i thought i heard something fall all right so so the the reality is that when you get to the the the, the horsemen the people, the, the, there's the horsemen of the, of, of, they say, of the apocalypse that's written in Revelation. It's called the apocalypse. But there are actually horsemen that are written in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ that take place in tribulation, which is the first seven years that leads up to the, uh, the millennial reign, which then leads up to the apocalypse of his glory. So there's a whole different reality of what that is. So Satan appears, and he possesses the Antichrist. So in chapter 2, he possesses the Antichrist as the man of sins, and son of destruction, plural. That's how the scripture writes it. Man of sins. Why is it sins, plural? Because he's a person of iniquity, which means to twist and pervert scripture. Uses truth, but twist it to his own end. <laughs> not cool. He does it very well, by the way. And he does it, by the way, mostly not from pagan people. He does it from people like me. He loves it when people like me behind a pulpit in the name of Christ, he, they can be used by him to twist scripture. Oh, he loves that. that that's where he plays the most. He loves that. Because he loves no more than ever you mock God and say, look, I used your own guy, your own person to, to, to mock you. <laughs> he loves that. Like Elijah was scared stiff when a demon appeared before him when Jezebel summoned him. He was like, what the heck? And he ran. He ran. So This guy just saw God destroy false prophets off a cliff in Mount Carmel. 
And he just saw that. Like, it's a one dude against all the, this kill. And then one woman who's so in, uh, and she's a demon, and he runs. Like, what the? And so then God goes, you know what? No, we're not playing this game. I'm going to shelf you. You're going to watch as I now use other prophets because you weren't man enough and you weren't have faith enough because you were immature thinking you were the only one. It was all about you. No, no, you missed the point. You missed the entire point. I love you. You meant well, but you missed it. He was immature. He was foolish. So God set him aside. He used other prophets. Then Elijah then teaches Elisha, and later on Elijah is taken up, which is why Elijah is going to come back because he's going to come back with Moses and tribulation and nail down to seal the deal and point out who the Antichrist is as the false god. And the false prophet is a false prophet. So as the man of sins, he's trying to twist the scripture. As son of destructions, he's trying to lead people into, Jeho he's trying to keep you ignorant into Jehoshaphat, even though he can't even, he can't, it's not his, God has ordained that, but the reality is he's the author of sin. He's the father of sin. That's imputed to him as his fault. And then you have also the other aspect of, of Gog and Magog, and which leads into the ultimate lake of fire. So the lake of fire and, and all these other destructions that he has, it's all on him, particularly Jehoshaphat in the lake of fire. But then you have, he comes in as, uh, again, on the white horse, he's the man of sin. He has a bow with no arrows, showing he has authority with oratory speech and convincing uh, manipulation, but he has no real force. He's not doing it with a sword or with military might. He's doing it with his political persuasions. And then as the red horse, he starts to then uh, distinguish that Christianity needs to be shut down and it's hate speech, and uh, it's, it's divisive, it's not part of the one world religion, that kind of thing, and he starts to shut it down quick and destroy Bibles, shut down websites, close out churches, you name it. And then midpoint, uh, some people in Christ think they can take him out, and they, they kill him. The Antichrist who's possessed by Satan, they kill him. And he lays dead for three days, he comes back up again, and Satan goes, <laughs> okay, I was just possessing him, wait till you see this. And he, he, then, he, then he actually uh, incarnates the body of the deceased Antichrist, he incarnates him, and now he's Satan in the flesh. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's why it's called the beast. Now he's the lawless one. That's not even close to funny. And when that happens, he gets hell on wheels. Now he goes right after the Jewish people and kills about five million in less than about two months. And they think Holocaust was bad. That ain't nothing. That happened over years, six million. Five million in a couple months, drop dead. Like he kills them. He's not even close to playing around. He, that's why Jesus said, pray, pray, pray that this ban the abomination of desolation, you better pray it doesn't happen on the Sabbath day or in the winter or when you're pregnant or sucking on the breast. You better pray because you got, you got a small chance, even if you're healthy and all vibrant, to make it from where you are to go travel about 2,000 miles down south to Petra. You got a far cry of, of being only 144,000, you're going to make it. So there's going to be millions of you. And I can tell you right now, it's not for the faint of heart. If you've got some kind of ailment or some kind of issue or some kind of, you're not going to, you just, you're going to have a very small chance as it is. You don't want to increase the odds if you're not making it. That's why Jesus said those things. So, so in this Second Thessalonians, he's talking about that. He talks about how the lawless one's revealed in two different, and he's, he's revealed because at the beginning, any Christ is revealing Satan at the beginning of tribulation when there's a wave one of a rapture. And it's actually one rapture, but in different waves, kind of like a graduation has the Valley Victorians go first, then honor society, then everybody else in alphabetical order. <laughs> I remember that. So that's kind of how this one graduation, just different phases. So there's one rapture, one, one catching away to the one place, but different phases. And these other two phases happen in, in the middle. And the lawless one then is, is on, when the, all the mature ones in Christ are taken out, who know the mysteries, then the lawless one is, he's right there. And there's no one else to stop him. And now, Christ has now brought other people into play, what he calls these soon medicoi people, which means soon with medicoi partakers of with the mysteries, who are now growing in their faith greatly to produce fruit along the way to become mature and to help others. Just like Paul, they can't be killed when the snake bit them at first, like the other apostles, but they at first, but they could later on, obviously they, they were killed. But at first they were prevented from all these different uh, inceptions of serpents can't kill them and poison can't kill them. But as you go through this whole process, he gets to chapter 3 as he ends with all this process between chapter 2 and chapter 3 of this story. He then talks about those who are being immature. They're going to be in a sad state of affairs because God's going to deal with them harshly. He's going to actually send delusion to them. God's going to purposely cause people who are immature to believe in lies. People who are, who are disobedient to believe in lies. Like... What? It says that in the scripture. It's in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, verse 11. And he says, And when on this account God will send them 
an energy or a power of delusion, to, to it means to stray and wander away, to believing the falsehood. And the falsehood they're going to believe in is the mark of the beast is not that bad. Because there's people that believe in Christ who will take the mark of the beast. They will not go, <laughs> they, they will not they be separated from Christ forever, but they, once you do that, it's, it, you're done. There's no inheritance you will ever, 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 ever have. You're done. So you can take the mark of the beast and still believe in Christ, but there's a heavy price to pay. You say, what is that price? If I get to still be forgiven, then what's the price to pay? Well, I don't know, 2,000 years of fiery torment? Sounds like a pretty hellacious amount of time to pay. I wouldn't go that way if I was you. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. That'd be no way, no way I'm doing that. But that's what's in store. It's not even close to funny. But that's what goes on. But I wouldn't do it. But folks are going to do it. Why? Because they're going to have their loved ones tormented. They're going to have their ability to say, well, God would want me to eat and drink and have shelter. And they're going to justify in their head the, the reason to take a mark. And, that, and, and, and that's like not, not smart. That's why in the mark, and the, we saw it before, and in Revelation, he, takes it, he says on the forehead or on the hand. It's a choice. He doesn't say which way or the other, which means you're choosing that as the person receiving it. Taking it up here means you just don't want to do commerce. You're believing and assenting he's God. And, and you're, you're known for who you are. You take it on the hand, you're saying, I'm doing it for commerce. I don't, I'm not saying he's my God, though. Which people of covenant and people in testament will not do that. People of covenant are all going to be either dead or in Petra, Jewish people. People in testament are going to be dropping like flies. And none of them will take the mark on the forehead. It's not going to happen. But they will on their hand, which is just plumb dumb stupid. But they're going to do it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm talking a lot of fast stuff here. No, it's a lot of information. The chip, right? I don't, it's a good thing you're asking. So, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, for about 20 plus years now, I've been reading all about um, different things that have been portrayed as. If you didn't hear, by the way, online, Ryan was asking, is the mark of the beast a chip either on the forehead or in the hand? And so the reality is that we don't know how he's going to use the mark of the beast, whether it's a, a visible tattoo, if people go as that far, they go as simple as that, or is it complex? Is it like, is it like a vaccine virus? They put a nano. Uh, biomarker in you? Is it actually a chip underneath your skin? What is it? We don't know what it actually is. We don't know. We just know it has the number 666. That we do know, right? So we just don't know what it is. And so the reality is that people say, I would never do that. And so I always jest with people and say, you, you do realize that you do it all, the, you, you've already done it and you did it to your kids. What do you mean? You gave them a social security number. You, you just marked them. Since where does God say in the Bible you have to mark your kid with a number? Where is that ever good? You did that with a social security number. Just saying. And you did it with a driver's license as well. You, you took on, and once you take on a birth certificate, you do that. By the way, there used to be birth announcement. If you ever seen one, it's a small index card. You say a birth certificate's a big long number. And there's a number at the bottom of this birth certificate. You can actually go to ustreasury.gov sites and you can look up uh, uh, bonds and you can pull that number in and it comes up as an EE bond. I'm like, what the heck? Because they commoditized us. It's what they've done. And so it, there's a whole different thing about what that's done. People say, I would never do it. But you already have. That's how ignorant you're being. You're forgetting what the government has already in our country, let alone throughout the rest of the world. What they've already made you believe is no big deal. We need it. Because without a birth certificate, without a, without a driver's license, without a social security number, you can't get a checking account. You can't go to work, right? So you can't have credit. So they know all this. So like we fall for it. What that, what, that, what, that, what that means is without those things, we can't do commerce, right? So we're doing that now. What do you think they're going to do when the earth is darkened and it's black and it's demonic? And he says, oh, you're hungry, are you? Oh, you, you, think, you think that having a house and shelter and having nice cushy things was what you wanted? You, I think food and water is a little bit more essential <laughs> and going to make you more desperate. So I'm going to think you're going to probably take whatever the mark that is, whether it's a chip, whether it's a vaccination, whatever it is, he, you're going to be doing that. Now, here's the thing, by the way, to, to that point, though. People have asked him before, do I think it's this, do I think it's that? The technology, the medical, the pharmaceutical, whatever he's going to use, it's already, in, it's already out there. Just like right now, the Antichrist is already alive. He's already here. He's just not in power yet. He's here which means he comes to power around 30 years of age. So I bet you he's, he's, he's in his uh, mid-20s, in my opinion. So I think he's already here. He's about, he's about, he's, he's about to be, be brought up. So he, he's here. So the reality is that with all that being said, I don't know that for sure. I'm not God. I'm just saying based on what I see in Scripture, that's what I think. I don't know that for sure. No one knows for sure. But the reality is I think he's here. And 
whenever he comes to power, he's going to use what mankind has been ignorant enough to think they can further mankind. Because think about it, we think we're bettering mankind. We think we're going to extend our life. We think we're going to usher in the world of peace. We think we're going to make the world a better place. We think we're going to go to Mars. We're going to go and like Star Trek and Star Wars and have spaceships flying around in space. We think all this. And God just laughs. Like, you guys are so ignorant. And yet, here's Satan. He's going to use all the things that we're putting in place. To, he's going to use that in his seven-year tribulation period when he runs the world. He's going to use all those things. What we're doing is creating, a, a, like I mentioned before, a spiritual Home Depot and Lowe's for him. He's going to pick everything that we've been, oh, oh thanks, thanks for this vaccination that has a different technology. Thanks for this technology of the chip stuff. Thanks for putting all that into place. I used you to do that, you morons. But now I'm going to use it to now en en entrap you and, and to entwine you with, with lies and deceit and so forth. That's what he does. He uses truth to exact unrighteousness to get you to, to react. And you're supposed to respond, which means filter what you hear, give it over to God, take captive the thought, and then respond. Reaction is just your emotion coming out. Don't do that. That's bad. That's bad. You don't react in your emotion. That's always bad. Don't react with your knee-jerk thoughts. That's not good. So that's going into our segue into, again, he talks about, talked on Friday about the sanctification and the spirit in chapter 2, verse 13, and beliefs of the truths, plural, and about obtaining, or the peripoesis in verse 14 of chapter 2, which is the uh, inheritance of becoming the bride of Christ. So, a little dovetail on this, Mariah. So, we have like the bride of Christ, people think of Christianity, everybody who believes in Christ is the bride of Christ. That's not true. There's the bride of Christ, and then there's maidens, and then there's, we, we call that, that's called the church, the called out. I didn't write this, but people misunderstand because, we say, they, misunderstand, they misunderstand because of this one thing. They miss the English words from the Greek words and think, tomato, tomato, who cares? <laughs> How could you possibly, and I, again, I use the analogy all the time, that our grandson is from Puerto Rico. So his mother named his father Jorge, not George. We call him George. That's fine. There's no problem with that. But you can't go to his mom and to his people in, in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, to the hospital, to the doctors, not to the family, and go, you call him George. That is just so disrespectful and ignorant. I can't even put words to that. That is, how could you possibly think that that's appropriate? It's not. His name's Jorge. That, that's what they called. It's okay to call him George, as long as you understand that's not what she called him when he was born out of the womb. That's not what the doctors put on the birth certificate. That's not what he was called. So Jesus is fine to use, but it's not his real technical name. It's Yeshua. So in the same way, the scripture wasn't written in English. It was written in other languages. So if you're going to, all you're going to do is study the English and go, I, I know this because my pastor said, or I know this because my tradition says, and you're basing it on English? Words? Check yourself. You got 5,000 errors because you have 5,000 words in Hebrew and Greek collectively. You can't put to English. You can't put to English. You just can't. So you have to study the language. So the reason people understand, misunderstand the different positions in Christ is because they think the word called or kaleo means that God called the whole world to believe in him. That's not true. That's not true. Jesus in John 17 made it clear. I pray not for the world, but only those that you gave me. Okay. It says in Matthew, he came to save his people from their sins. Sounds kind of exclusive. Jesus said in Matthew 10, appointing the apostles, he said, I want you to go not to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Gentiles were the not Jewish people. Samaritans were half-breeds. They were Jews and Gentiles mixed in. Jews married into Assyria's, Assyrians specifically. That's where it started from. So, okay. So, God said, go not to the Gentiles or half-breeds, if you will. Go on to the Jewish, the perishing stock of the house of Israel. Sounds kind of bigoted. Sounds kind of narrow-minded. Sounds kind of judgmental to me. In today's politically woke society, it sounds like Jesus is pretty much, uh, you know, not nice. He's not inclusive of everybody. I didn't write the book. In Matthew 10, verses 1 to 7, read it yourself. He said it. He said it. So when he says that, he's pointing out to us constantly, time and time again, that he has a unique people he calls out. Not everybody. He calls them. He calls people a certain people. He called Abraham from the area of the Chaldees. A pagan, by the way, a Gentile. People forget his, his mother and father and his whole family worship multiple idols. And then he goes, you, me. Me? Yeah, you. Come here. And he's like, okay. And then he's a, or he's a Chaldean. A chapter later, from chapter 12 to chapter 13, he's brought in, well, between there, he's brought to the Mount, uh, Mount Moriah uh, to, to sacrifice Isaac later on, but Mount, Mount Moray, he, he is actually taught, the word means teacher, 
He's taught by Christ, uh, Hebrew, or by God, Hebrew. He's made into a Hebrew. Two chapters later, when his nephew, Lot, is taken captive, they call him a Hebrew. There's no such thing as a Hebrew. They're, they didn't even exist. What are you talking about? He was a Chaldean from the Ur of the Chaldees. That's what it says. Two chapters later, he's called a Hebrew. Well, what the heck happened? All that happened is God called him and God taught him. Well, obviously, God must have called him and taught him the language and traditions and manners of a new, out of thin air. God just went, oh, this is the Hebrew language. Learn this, son, and act this way and dress this way. Oh, okay. And they go, he's a Hebrew. Well, what's with that? God just called him. He's a, he's a symbolism or a type of what a one new man looks like. Out of nothingness, it came into existence using what was already there. He used the pagan side of who Abraham was, took it, but then brought into existence something that was never existed before. A new people, Hebrew. Just like he brought into existence Jew and Gentile and goes, no longer are you one Jew or one Gentile. Now you're one new man in Christ. Wow, that's pretty awesome stuff. Well, that's what he does. That's what Christ does. He's God. So that's what happened. So when you go over to the New Testament here, the beliefs and the truths are the beliefs in these upper level of depth of who God is in His Word. Then you go to chapter 3 of, of 2 Thessalonians, more of our text now. We talked about on Friday where he talked about in verse, in verse 2 that he wants them then to be delivered from perverse, or that is the word again, a topon, or out of place people. And he talks about in verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 3 that faithful is the Lord who will establish and guard. And the word establish, again, is durezo, which means to firm up and to, and to guard, to which means to a, a philosopher, which means to a military guard. God's going to have a strict eye on you. That's pretty awesome, man. You say, well, God's a strict eye on everybody. No, 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 no. Let me, let me he'll help you understand. If I were to say the statement, did, did God and does God love Israel? Well, sure. Let me ask you the question. Did, did Jesus talk to everybody in Israel the same way? No. He had 12 apostles he called out. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not him. He, he, he went to his people and called out 12. And then, in Luke 10, he calls out another 70 everybody wants to forget about. So he called out 70 as a group that were not close to him as the 12. He had 12 that were real close to him. And of those 12 close to him, he called out Peter, James, and John specifically on multiple occasions to be the ones unique to him, close to him. Then he has James, of those three, is the first apostle to die. Peter and John, the first two apostles to be there at his resurrected tomb. John, the only one to be there who was actually Saul's resurrected Lord in, in the empty tomb. He saw him first. He's the only one to see the revelation. He's the only one to live the longest life. He's the only one to die a natural death as they tried to kill him. And he couldn't be killed. He was the one he gave in charge of watching over Mary, the one who bore him. Peter was the one who was oh, crucified upside down to depict not being worthy of being crucified like Christ was. So these are people that were earmarked as the three among the twelve, and it can go time and time again. Old Testament, same way. God put Levites as different from the rest of them. God put the Judaites as the line of kings. You can go on. Don't, don't give me this malarkey garbage that God loves everybody, and it's in the same way. That's the same manifestation. Well, that's, that's a southern fine. It's not true. It's just not true. Stuff's not true. It's not true. God says, I love Jacob, and I hated Esau, and the word means lesser loved. And if you don't believe that, read about Esau. Read it. God did not send him to hell and go, I hate you and I'm fire. Just the opposite. Read the story. Forget what pastors tell you. They're, all, they're, they're lying to you when they say Esau's in hell burning. No. When he sees Jacob, Jacob sees Esau. After Jacob was told that he stole his father, he stole his birthright from his father, Esau said, when I see you again, I'm going to kill you. His father dies. They see each other. And Esau, not Jacob, runs up to him, hugs him, on the cheek, hugs him, kisses him on the cheek, and Jacob says to Esau, when I've seen your face, I've seen the face of God. And he's a guy you're going to tell me that God hates. Matter of fact, God gives him a possession of Mount Seir. He tells Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and the Israelites, don't mess with the descendants of Edom from Esau. I gave them Mount Seir as their possession. Doesn't sound like somebody, he hates the hell. So stop lying and making it sound like God hates this guy to some condemnation. No, he lesser loves him. It's the same word used of Leah and Rachel. Leah was lesser loved than Rachel by Jacob because Jacob wanted Rachel first and foremost. We all know this, right? So there's the reality. So there's a little truth no one wants to hear. God loves people differently? Yes. Yes, he does. Well, it's not what my preacher says. I don't care what he says. The scripture says differently. Read John 3, 16. Yeah, fine. For God so loved the world, his only begotten son, who should believe in him. Okay, yeah. 
Read further on in the same chapter, and you'll find where he says, in him not believing in God has the wrath of God abiding on him already. What? Yeah, I didn't write the book, man. If you read the entire book, stop letting preachers lie to you, you'll realize that the book has more things in it about who God is than what you think he is. And that's what Paul's talking about. So Paul talks about the, 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 the responsibility, the accountability before God. That, yeah, you don't want to fear. Again, you don't want to fear and be all like, oh my God, God's got a heavy hand. No, 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 no. You want a healthy respect and reverence for who God is, just like you do for anything else that is true and right in this world. I have a healthy respect for police and prison. I don't like all the times how people who occupy those offices exploit them. I don't like that. But I have a healthy respect that the law, when upheld correctly, when, when, when the law is not exploited, <laughs> I have a healthy respect for the law as it is, not the people who represent it, but the law as it is, the prisons, I know what they represent, right? I have a healthy respect for that. But I have no fear of, 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 of all of a sudden being indicted as a felon if I'm not going to be committing crimes, right? I have no fear of that. You, you can't trump up charges on me that have no existence, that have no proof of evidence, right? So I have no, unless you want to try to frame me, I guess, right? But I'm not in fear of that. The reality is that the same with God. God's not going to frame you. So as long as you're not looking at trying to, you know, uh, break the law of God's law, or it's going to be disobedient and, and, and just insubordinate to him, why are you afraid of his righteous judgments? Nothing to be afraid of. But if you are living disobedient as a person who believes in him, you have a lot to be afraid of. And that's why he says in 2 Peter, better to have not known him than to know him and be like a dog returning to the vomit or a pig to the mire. It's not funny. You don't want to do that. You do not want to know God and play games. Oh, he doesn't like that at all. Oh, not at all. That's why he said in Hebrews 10 that how much worse under two witnesses and one testifies against Moses and they didn't, they, 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 were, they were found guilty. How much worse should you be if you took the, the blood of Christ and sanctified it and you trampled it underfoot? How much worse is he going to take that on you? I mean, it's not funny. He's just saying, I love you and you believe in me, but you want to earn more of my love than you have to, it's like anything else. You love your kid no matter what, but you have an extra measure of love when that kid lives responsibly, obediently, contributing to their walk with God in society. It makes you more proud. You're always going to love them no matter what, but you love them even more when they do those things, right? So, hey, who, who made you? God. Why is God any different? God, God's the same way. He loves us, but he loves us more when we do the things that he expects us to do and commands us to do. So there's a generalistic love, and then there's a higher level, which is what verse 3 is talking about in 2 Thessalonians 3, where he guards. And then in verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians 3, he said, We have confidence in the Lord concerning you because the things we commanded you, both you are doing and will do. This kind of sums up what we're saying. He's saying, I, and he says that we have confidence. That means he's fully persuaded. That's the, the phrasing there. He's fully persuaded. This is Paul, Silas, Timothy. That's the we. And we have full confidence, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, that the Lord, concerning you, that because we have confidence in how he's in your life because of what we've told you to do, you've actually been doing it, and you continue to do it. This is good. You're actively moving on in your faith. You're maturing. Then he says in, in verse 5, at 2 Thessalonians 3, and may the Lord direct your hearts. And the word direct there. He means that the Lord may actually get to the core reasons and motivations and intentions of your heart into what? Into, into not just love and patience, no, no, into the love of God, which means not just loving God from an emotional standpoint or intellectual standpoint or mental, no, no. He means from the depth of what Scripture has told you who He is and the depth of Scripture of what He's given to you to understand what's out ahead and what you are, who you are in Christ. And because of that depth of who he is, what his word means to you, because of that, you have the intentions and motives of your heart being checked and vetted and balanced. And into the patience, which is the remaining under endurance resilience of Christ. Is there any better representation of God showing you resilience and endurance than the person of God the Son, Christ, living on this earth and what he went through? Well, yeah. He could have went, he could have come as a matured adult and never died and then shed some blood voluntarily and been like, okay, I'm done. Why not do it that way? Why not come as a mature adult and then take a knife and like, like to do it Indians, you know, back in the Indian days, you know, just cut yourself and go, here's my blood and I'm good. Why, why the nasty, disgusting death? Why the vicariously violent death? Why all the betrayal? Why the spitting in the face? Why the punching and smacking? Why the betrayal of your best friends? Why all that? Why go through all of that, right? You know why? Because he can say to you, I get it. 
Don't give me this garbage. You know what it's like? God, my friends betrayed me. My loved ones who are supposed to love me didn't love me. <laughs> like he doesn't understand. Like he's been, That's why he did that. So he can say to you and me, I get it. I got it. Don't give me this stuff I haven't been through. It was mentally, mentally, psychologically, physically, emotionally. It was draining for him. In Gethsemane, he said he sweat as cloth of blood. That's what, he, that's what he was showing you that for. To let us know he loves us, that he, he chose to be resiliently enduring. Hupomino, it's a word for patience here. He went under, he submitted under the will of the Father, having his own will. He could have said no, but he said, I'm going to think about it. Even though I have the power and the right and the ability to go, no! He said, I'm going to take this. So how much, what does that tell us? You have the right to do something, doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And I'm so myself tired of people telling me that garbage. Well, I have the right to do this. You have no rights, you doofus. If you're in Christ, then you have no rights. You have none. You're a slave to what is right. And you must do what is right, regardless of what your right is. You may have the right to do something, but it's the right and wrong way to do it. It just is. There was a book that uh, your friend Robin told me about, a Muslim guy, a young man who went from being Muslim to being in Christ, and he died at a young age. But one of the things in his book he talked about the Muslims even say is that it's the how you do something that I mentioned before is more important than the what you do because they were talking about you can believe all you want to believe, but you have to live a certain way to, to validate that you're trying to find yourself worthy before God in their mind. But in our mind, we're not trying to find ourselves worthy to gain some initial acceptance. We already have the initial acceptance. We want the added acceptance and approval that we have a job well done. I just don't want to graduate with a, with a 2.0. I want to graduate 4.0. I don't know about you. I want to be in the valley. I want to have some sashes and stuff. Not because I want to show off. No. No, because I want to be there. I want to see him put that on me. I want to see. He's going to give you crowns and stuff. I want to, don't you want to be having him lavish love on you? Who wouldn't want that? Who would want him to lavish undying love on you? It's unbelievable. He's want to lavish on you more love and more. That's what he wants to do. So that's what Paul's talking about. This is why he says, may God take your intentions and your motives and direct your hearts into the love of God and the patience of Christ. And in verse 6 he says, now we charge you. And this is that word we get like in the, in the old medieval times that they would, I dub you the night or, or in, 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 the mid, in the wild west, you know, I deputize you, which means you're dubbing somebody, you're imputing to somebody the authority. The authority of what? He tells him what? He says, I charge you now, I give you the authority, I impute, we, we're, there's, he's saying, look, I want y'all to be afraid, because we're Paul and Silas and Timothy. No, you all are mature enough now that I've, I'm going to charge you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to withdraw. That means, the word there is to arrange in place in an ongoing tense, it's written. To arrange, in other words, I want you to make order of people, of, in what way? Is it of every brother, I want you to take ongoing measures of arranging in place from every brother, not person who believes in Christ. No, he says brother. That means a person who is believing in Christ and he wants to live obedient to Christ. That's the word he uses for brother here. A person who's wanting to live obedient, who walks out of order. <laughs> out of order. Whoa, 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 whoa. So that means, again, he walks unbecoming. He's not living in a way of being obedient. He's being insubordinate. So he's telling you, He's Paul, Silas, Timothy, telling the mature ones in Thessalonica, I'm imputing to the authority to, to take measures to, to actually put arrange in order how you're going to you know, treat these people who are adamantly, volitionally insubordinate. People say, you have to forgive me no matter what. I remember a kid one time literally pulled his pants down and showed his buttocks to me and mooned me and said, ha-ha. He was a person who said believed in Satan. And I won't forget it. He was in a paca, and he pulled his pants down, butt crack and all, and he said to me, tell your God to take that. Right in front of his mom, by the way, who's right there at the doorway. His mom's at the doorway, and his kid's about probably, I don't know, maybe 18 years old. And he, he literally pulled his pants down. And I'm not joking. It really happened. And, and, and he said that to me. It was, on, it was right off a major thoroughfare of, if you know about Orlando, it's 441 OBT and Apopka. He did that. And then it's right off the main it was road off that. He did that. And his mom's in the, in, in the, in the doorway. He's in the driveway. I'm outside. And he said, and see, you guys still have to love me, haha. Ha. And I go, no, he doesn't. No, he goes, oh, what's the matter with that? Well, Satan loves me. And I go, you know what? We're not having this conversation. What you're doing is belligerent, and you know it is. And I'm, uh, no offense. And, and, and to the mom, I said, no offense, but that's, all, that's a lot of that's on you. I cannot believe that you're, you're just not even, even checking your son right now and his actions right now. You know, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not going to, don't ever call me again. You can throw away my card. 
I don't exist. You can unless you want to talk about something serious and go back on all this stuff. But sir, if you want to proceed on this thought process, I have no association, none. I'm good. Um, thank you very much. So I, I did. I, I arranged in place my purpose there. I'm like I'm done with this. And best guess what? I never talked to him ever again because I never once made right with that situation. I'm out. So. There you go. So I withdrew from that, that's for sure. I arranged in play. That is definitely not, that wasn't even a brother though, obviously. But that was a person trying to make fun of God's love. No matter what, God's God loved me, trying to exploit. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. That's an extreme example of how people are doing things. He says they're not walking, but what are they not walking in according to? Uh, what does he tell you in verse 6? To the instruction. That is the, the word again for the traditions he mentioned earlier in chapter 2 in verse uh, 15. And that's the instruction. I want you to see this. So if you go over to 1 Corinthians 11, you'll see that Paul writes about what this instruction is also earlier. In 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 1 and 2, Paul says, Become imitators of me, which means emulators. Emulate my behavior. Emulate the way I teach, the way I talk, the way I walk. He said, emulate me even as I am of Christ. So you see what he's saying? See, this is where people get mistaken. I don't like it. I, just to be honest with you, I have a lot of rising up, you know, frustrations and irritations with people who say, emulate me when you're not emulating Christ. Paul says emulate me because he's emulating Christ. It's like one person always said to me, well, my wife uh, doesn't love me. Or, or, the, or the woman says, I can't find a, a good man. You know what? If a man lived the way that Christ wants, wants him to live, is not one woman alive. Who wouldn't want to be with that man? So don't 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 give me this garbage about how when a woman lives when a woman says I can't find the right kind of man that's because it's on the man who's not living the way he's supposed to. If he lives the way he's supposed to and he's the he's the soul made for that one, then you're gonna know. And if you're married to somebody, then get get <laughs> get right, you know. So the reality is, don't just say obey me. No, do what you're supposed to do. Live the way Christ wants you to do, and then they can emulate you. That's what Paul is talking about. He didn't say just emulate me. No, emulate me because he's emulating Christ. The onus is on the person who's calling for the emulation. The onus is on the person who's in the leadership role to lead by example. So in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 11, he said, And brethren, I praise you because you have remembered all my... There it is again. The Tospedia. There's that instructions again. And retain the observances as I delivered them to you. So what he's talking about on the observances or traditions, he's not referring to Jewish traditions. He's referring to the traditions that were passed on to him that Christ passed on to him, which is what? The mysteries of the depth of the Word of God that he has sown to them, the uniquenesses of details, truth within truth. He's been passed on by Christ, this, this wow gospel that even Peter said, Paul's writing is difficult to understand. He's passed it on to them, and he's saying to them, you're doing good at, at emulating what I had to emulate, what I heard from Christ. That's the traditions he's talking about. Not Jewish org. No. This is the Spirit of Christ teaching Paul for three years mysteries, the depth of Scripture. Those traditions is what Paul taught, and it's those traditions that they're holding true. And when brethren act unbecoming of those traditions, he's saying, arrange and separate yourself from them. I give you the authority to do that. Yes. Vicki said, uh, this is made more difficult when it is a family member. No joke. Right? That's a, so true. When it's a family member. We're, we're going to get more into that too. Just read on. It gets, you're right. Oh, my gosh. Believe me. That's the very thing that I was thinking about when I was reading this with the Lord going, <laughs> Lord, when they're led by blood, I have another tier of our responsibility that's already been disclosed to me about how I'm supposed to love on my family too. So I'm like, yikes. So go to verse 7. Well, we're going we're to get into that. Go to verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 7. He said, for you yourselves know. That means the word know means that the word aida. It means you've, you've personally seen an experience. When would they personally see an experience that? When he was in Acts 17 with them for about six months. They already heard and saw physically Paul act, talk, preach, teach, interact relationally with different variations of humans. Those that were disobedient, those that were foolish, those that were immature, those that were of covenant, those in the testament. They saw it. He said, you already know. So um, he's writing this letter from Corinth to Thessalonica, Timothy delivering it. But he's saying to them, look, you already saw me though for six months, so we already know what's up. We already know you know who I am. Didn't like I'm 
hiding behind some ivory tower. You've seen me front row and center live amongst you for a day and nights and weeks and months. Yes? Todd said, how do you know that this word tradition in verse 6 are words passed on directly from Christ to Paul and not the tradition, uh, the Jewish traditions? Okay, because when you go back, when you go back to verse 15 of 2 Thessalonians in context, the traditions were, he said, that were taught to you by word or letter. Um, those are, he's talking about retaining those things. He's talking about brethren standing firm. He's talking about standing firm in the things that were taught by word or letter. And he mentioned earlier the standing firm was about the mysteries. Then in Second Thessalonians, and then, then in First Corinthians 11, what we just read, the first verse is about how he's emulating Christ, and the verse after that is about traditions that he's been handing on. The traditions he handed on were not Jewish because that's not what Christ taught him. That's how I know. So in 1 Corinthians 11, he just got finished telling us in verse 1, emulate me because I emulate Christ. Christ did not indoctrinate him with Jewish tradition of Hebrew roots. No, he did not. Nope. Not at all. So when Paul in verse 2 of, of 1 Corinthians 11 says, are you doing a good job of following the instructions that I was given to you, that he just told you he got from Christ because he was emulating Christ, tells you they weren't Jewish traditions of old. No. They were not Mosaic law. No. They were not Abrahamic covenant. No. We also know that because how he talks about those things in Galatians, in the right letter to the Galatians. We also know again in the context of 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, verse 15, where again he mentions to stand firm and to retain the instructions that you were taught, and whether by our word or letter, taught by them, not by the previous Mosaic covenant. He's also, we know it's also not Jewish, He's talking about not the Jewish Mosaic or Abrahamic laws or covenants because he's also talking to a dominant who kind of people? Gentile people who have come to know Christ. The majority of the people are Gentile. They got no clue about Jewish traditions, nor do they care. Ain't happening, right? So the traditions he's talking about are from the mysteries that he's established when he was there with them for a couple months that he's continuing to build on. That's what he's talking about. That's how I know. So you have a lot of reasons why. The context of 2 Thessalonians 2.15 in the same flow of the same letter. The fact that who he's talking to, the audience itself, is not all Jewish. It's dominantly Gentile. The other aspect of he's referencing that same phrasing in 1 Corinthians 11, emulate me because I emulate Christ and, 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 and sequence of events after that. He then talks about divinely instructing them after talking about he's emulating Christ. So he's divinely instructing them as he's emulating Christ, which means he's not instructing them or giving traditions to them that are Mosaic or Abrahamic. He's not doing that. He's giving them mysteries and secrets. And we know that from reading the other context. Hope that answers your question. Yes? And Todd said that's the demise in Catholicism where traditions or man's words supersede the word of God. Correct. So this is, this is, where, this is you're right, sir. It's a good point you're making. So in Catholicism, the, man of, the man's word precedes the word of God, and this is what's different. What Paul is saying at the time, remember, remember, what was their concordance? They didn't have one. Where's their word study book that we have? They, they didn't have one. How did they study God's word? Think, I want you to think about this. Think about this. You have a great point you just made. Why is he emphasizing what you heard by word or by letter? Because by back then, they had no concordance or online. You can click online. What does this word mean? They didn't have that. There's no internet. There's no concordance books. There's no word study books. So how did they know? They listened at the feet of Paul, because Christ is losing him, right? The, right? They read his letter intently. They talk about it in the groups, about what he's talking about. That's how they learned. They respected God's man that he chose to speak to them. And they respected that he was the one who's confirmed by God to give that word. And that's why Paul's calling it his traditions, because he's the one, as the Bible's being written, he's one of many that God is using to write these words. And he's saying you're holding true to what God told you about in Mark 16, that these signs will follow them. Not everybody who believes in Jesus, but those who are called upon to validate and confirm the word. He's confirming the word. And that's what he's talking about. The tradition of his teaching is the important aspect of it. And so, yeah, it was, in his case, man's word at first. But it wasn't just man's word, was it? This is where the Catholics get it from. 
They get it from saying, hey, well, since the apostles did that, and it was their word that man is supposed to take because the Bible was being written, we are now the continual voice of God. And eh, wrong, back of the class, you, you got a dunce hat. That is incorrect. You are incorrect. You were not the 12 apostles. You were not in Mark 16. Stop your lies. The resurrected Lord did not talk to you personally. Stop your lies. You, you are, that's just lies. Lies upon lies upon lies. You are not the one who can sit there and tell me that your voice is going to add new information to God's word. No, you're not. The apostles did that because it wasn't them doing it. It was God using their voice to speak. One author, many writers, right? That's what Paul's talking about. Hope that makes some sense. But you're at a great point about the Catholics. They're thinking that any man who holds on that priestal aspect or pulpal, papal aspect, he has that right to do that. That is totally not. They call it the vicar of Christ, the Pope, which is incredibly ridiculous. That means he's, his voice is God's voice. That's not true at all. He's a sinner. So not even, I'm, not, I'm not even God's voice. I'm a steward at best. God's not speaking in, in and through me all the time. He's using me. There's a difference. God uses me. He spoke directly through Paul, Peter, James, John, all the other apostles. Yes? Lainey said, I was going to ask who took over their teaching after Paul and Silas and Timothy left. And then she said, God. God did. God's the one, the Holy Spirit's our counselor, our teacher, right? And remember, there's, there is two kinds of apostles, don't forget. There's the apostles that Jesus appointed, the twelve. And then there's other people called apostles, like a Barnabas and a Silas, which are only called apostles when they were appointed by one of the original 12 apostles, or in this case, the one grafted in later, in Apostle Paul. Those are the only ones, only the 12 apostles could then dub someone else an apostle. No one else. And you can only be an apostle if Christ is the one who calls you an apostle. So Christ has to call you an apostle. That's the first step. And secondly, then as you were called by Christ an apostle directly, only you and only you can then call someone else an apostle. That's it. And since they're dead, there's no more apostles. There can't be. Because only they have the right to impute the ongoing office of ministry to help them in the apostleship. So they had somebody else, Barnabas, Silas, again, were referenced as apostles in the book of Acts. That's where that comes from. Yes? Tracy said this current one is not a Christian. Oh, the Pope, you mean, probably? That's why the Pope, probably. Yeah, I don't know. He's, uh, yeah. Yeah, remember, the word Christian, meaning uh, to live in a way that is a, uh, an ambassador of Christ. I would say there's a lot of people on this planet that believe in Christ. Remember, you can be in Christ and not be a Christian. This is two different things. So being a Christian is believing in Christ and living in a way that represents an ambassador of him. So there's many folks who fall into that category. Dare I say more than half of those in Christianity fall in that category. The evidence of that is when you get a Rick Warren book, The Purpose Driven Life, which basically says, have faith in God every day and read his book. People go, that's amazing. Are you serious right now? That's like telling an adult, hey, if you eat and drink, you won't ever die. What? You say, well, I'll die eventually. But you won't die today, though, probably, if you eat and drink. That, 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 those are essential. Well, what are you talking about? It's just so silly. It's a silly book. You, you want to believe and trust in God and read his word. That's like telling me that I have to eat to live and I have to drink water to live. Well, of course I know that, doofus. Why, why is that so re re revelation there? I don't know, I understand that. It's so ignorant to me. You can't eat junk food all the time. It's going to come back to curse you. I know that. It's so odd. To, no offense to Rick Warren. It's an ignorant statement to me. That whole book is about ignorance of people's sense of dumbing down God and his word. And all of a sudden they go, wow, man, that was profound. Profound? No offense. It's an indictment of where we are as a people. That's how, that's how watered down we'd see God in his word. That's what that tells me. It doesn't tell me he's a great guy. It tells me that God is convicting us of how slack we are at caring about him and his word. That's what it tells me. Yeah. And then Tracy said, yep, even, uh, exactly, even Satan believes in Jesus. Yeah. So in verse 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. And this is the word again, emulate, constantly, it's in the plural. This is 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate, emulate us constantly, because we were not, he said, disorderly among you. Meaning, we did not act out of place. We didn't talk out of place. We didn't act out of place. We didn't act unbecoming. Our behavior, how we thought and how we talked, was similar to what we believed. In other words, wouldn't, wouldn't it be shocking, 
like we all know people from the previous kingdom teachings, when they teach one thing, but they act another way. And don't tell me you don't, you don't know what I'm talking about, because I know you do. Right? I'm not going to go there. Let's just all imagine it. But it's like the, uh, you know, the Beach Boys song. I always think about, wouldn't it be nice if people act like they're supposed to? Wouldn't it be nice if we made God proud? But we don't do that, right? We just want to teach the right stuff and go, you see, I'm smart. And then go out and, and live like a jerk. And then people go, well, that's, you can't go to the restaurant, treat the waitress like she's nothing. Or, or the, the server, call them what you want, right? You can't treat another human being like they don't matter. It's because you have the mysteries. You can teach, and that means you give you a right to be a, a, a callous spouse or a ridiculous child, an insubordinate child, you know, or a thief at work. It's just, it's just wrong, right? It's just wrong. But in verse 8, Paul's saying in verse 7, do what we did. We have the truth, the depths, but we actually acted right. We, you saw us interact in our relationships, the dynamics. In verse 8, nor did we, oh, this is important here. He said, nor did we eat, and the word there is Dorian, nor did we gratuitously left side of the margin in the dialogue. We didn't gratuitously, the word is Dorian. We didn't freely uh, be given from you bread for nothing. But in toil, which is deep fatigue, or weariness, which is afflicted fatigue, which is through painful work. In other words, they were exhausted. They, whatever they, whatever they you were gave, he said, whatever you gave us to eat, we, you know that we weren't just like, fat cats going, since we're called by God, you must serve me. My cappuccino, please. No, come on. They, they weren't acting like that. They were saying, look, when you fed us bread and gave us water to drink, th that's great. But you knew, as well as we knew, we were laboriously working hard on behalf of God Almighty to, to, to give to you the truth. You know that. We put our own lives at risk for you. We, we put our own self out there constantly, forgo our own sleep, forgo our own feet, eating and drink, just so you can have the answers to your questions, to, to be available to you, to be loving on you, to minister to you. And that's the call to ministry. Today, people like me in my position, they want to say, hey, make it a career, we'll pay you this. Hey, do the revival, we'll pay you this. It's all about money now. That's what the congregations of Christianity have become, nothing but a business deal of how to make the most amount of money how to construct the most amount of structure to make yourself wealthy. And it's not a, oh, it's, it's tax-free, man. Are you serious right now? That's how folks see congregational teaching and preaching as a tax-free way of career to make money. And hey, it's, a, it's about Jesus, so it's good. I'd be careful of that because are you really laboring? Are you really toiling and weary? Are you really? Only God can answer that. You and God can answer that question. I'm not going to judge you. I don't know. But are you really toiling and weary for seeking God and His Word to help the people to understand likewise? That's your premise. That's your foundational, elementary, mandatory obligation. Mandatory obligation as a steward to teach God's Word. You have to be toiling and wearying before God to help the people. That's your, that's your, that's your, your, you have to do that. You can't have someone not do that and then just all of a sudden be taking freely all the things you're giving them just because of the position that they want to exploit by not working. That's what he says, working day and night so as to not be a burden. That word for burden is a constant burden upon you. You see what he's bringing up? He's bringing up two things here, by the way. He's bringing up the physical, but also the spiritual. Physically, he doesn't want to have them be a financial burden that they all of a sudden are this dead weight they got to support. They're actually contributing to their spiritual and they're contributing to the financial wealth, the health of, of things. They're not sitting back and wanting everything just to come to them. That's the point. They're not takers. They're givers. That's his point. He, they're giving. Whatever you give to them, he's saying, you know we, we, gave, we gave first. You do know that. We gave to God first our life, our spirit, our soul, our body on behalf of serving him. And if it benefits you, that's great. But you know if you're giving to us, it's because we gave first. And we didn't give first to you. God gave first to us. We're just giving back. That's all we're doing. He gave first. He loved us first. We're loving back. We gave back, and now you're giving to us. That's what he's basically saying. We're not saying we're in a position that God called us, therefore we're going to take from you all these things. You must give this to me. I'm going to explore what you gave to me because I don't have to work for it. No, you don't do that. You don't do that. This is where in verse 9 he says, not because we have no authority, but we, are, but we might ourselves be a pattern or a type for you to imitate. There's that word again, emulate us continuously. What he's saying is, they have the authority to say, I'm God's man. I'm God's call of the scriptures to be taught to you, which is true, they are. 
and the scripture is clear don't muzzle the ox that plows but is it does it does it make it does it make it so that the preacher the teacher the pastor the shepherd the the person who's who, who's like a me does it make does it give me a right to 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 therefore exploit the position to therefore say you must give to me you must help me paul saying no we never did that we never said you must give to me because we are the ones that god's called to help teach you we didn't say that ever do we infer it we didn't infer it we didn't say it we didn't act like it we didn't make you feel like it was a burden we never did that did we because we freely we received freely we gave and on on it went you gave to us the same way right so be like us when it comes time to you to give back be the same way do not act like you're entitled don't do that entitlement is bad do not act like you're entitled that's what he's basically saying because you're not entitled you have to work for what you have and you better give back because it was given to you first and in verse 10 he goes on and builds on this thought for also when we were with you this we commanded you same word again we charge you with this, the authority. If anyone is not willing, that means the word thela was there. That means they made a cognitive, willful, demonstrative choice not to work. If they're willing not to work, he says, don't let them eat. Wow. That's uh, pretty, pretty. <laughs> so if they have the, if they're making a cognitive choice. I'm not even, I'm not even, I don't have to work. I'm not going to work. You must give me, give me, give me, give me, because I'm entitled. No one's entitled, my friends. Sorry. No one is. The only thing you're entitled to is sin and death. You're entitled to that. Good luck with that. You're not entitled to anything good. In verse 11, he goes on and says, For we hear of some among you walking out of order. Is that word again? Back in verse 6. Walking out of order. In other words, not becoming, insubordinate, unruly not working but it says here being above work and the word here for being above work is they're actually doing things that are actively engaged but you're just kind of like we'd say busy bodies or like the scripture in in first timothy 3 6 and 7 they're ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth they're always doing something but never working they're never productive but they're always busy we know folks like that we, we've, we've all been there. I know, I know I've been. And he's saying you can't do that. And by the way, he's not referring just to the physical. He's referring to the spiritual. You can't just go, well, I spend time with God. I love people. I have this one, I'm not going to say who it is. But I had this one friend one time. I, I, he's still a friend today. We just don't talk as much. But he would say, oh, we study this, 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 this. And, and I said, that's great. And then he'd say, we're studying the book of blank. And I said, that's great. And I said, hey, what, what do you, what's the one thing you're learning? And he goes, I don't know. I thought you said you were studying the book. Well, then I'm just, no, no, no. What I mean is, I just don't remember. Okay, why don't, okay, let me rephrase the question. Tell me anything at all that you can remember what you've studied. I don't know. Nothing at all. So you have no problem with your memory. You're a vibrant young, young man, and you can't tell me any. How long have you been studying this, this, this book? About three weeks now. And you can't tell me anything at all that you've been studying. No offense, I don't take you seriously. I think that you're just there, and you're going to the class for the hour, and you're checking out, but you're not doing any of the work. You're not going home and reading. You're not praying, talking to God. You're not engaging in the conversation and fellowship. You're not. So don't lie. Just, fine, fine, fine. Lie to me all you want, fine. Don't lie to God and yourself. That's bad, man, because I'm going to die one day. I don't matter. He, I, your relationship with God is what matters. Why lie to yourself and God? Who cares about posturing before man? Man's, man's a bunch of losers. We're all liars and thieves. So who cares what we think about each other? What, what matters is what God thinks about us. And that's what he's basically saying. They're, they're busy trying to get about. So you can say, oh, look, he's always, or she's always engaged. It doesn't matter. If you're engaged in anything, are you actually working? Are you actually putting forth the effort to know who God is in your life? Put forth the effort to know what his word says. Are you doing that? He's talking about the physical, yes, but it's a spiritual implication, which is why in verse 12 it makes more sense when he says, Now such we charge and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that working with quietness, which means stillness and tranquility, let they may eat their own bread. Meaning, don't harass them. Don't berate them. Don't interfere with their false narrative of their fake reality. 
They want to live in a veneer society. And by the way, it's going to irritate you because I know it does me. When they want to act like they're spiritual and they know all this Christian stuff and they want to put out little anecdotes or little things they want to say, put a little Jesus on it, stuff like that. They want to talk, but they know nothing about nothing about nothing, but yet they want to have enough verbal talking points to make it sound like they know stuff and they want to throw things at you to insult you or to berate you or act like, I know, and you don't really know anything. So, but that's okay. He said basically ignore them. Let them be in their own little quiet space. Don't insult them. Don't make fun of them. Let them be. Let them be. They're playing games with their own spiritual walk, we're basically telling you. It's not, it's, that's between them and God. They want to play games with God? Let, let them have it. Let them have it. Let them, let them have it. Let them think that they've won the battle, they've won the war, and they're being seen as this great, wonderful person. Fine, fine, fine. Have it your way. I'm not going to bother you. Be in your stillness and your tranquility. Eat your own bread. In other words, eat your own desserts. You want to have what you're, you're creating? Lie in your own bed. Have your own recompense. In verse 13, he said, But you, brethren, should not remiss. And that means is, do not be discouraged, do not be faint of heart, in doing well. And doing well is the word kalos in it, which is the root word for the external good. Remember, kalos good only comes out of an agathos good. And the people he's talking about that are acting like they're working and are in their own little still quiet little denial stage, they are acting like they have an agathos disposition, which means a renovated heart, mind, soul, and spirit that is seeing themselves as totally depraved and God is the one who's the only one who's good who can infuse in them how to think, how to act, how to walk, how to talk. And you're still struggling with that. We all do. But the agathos disposition of goodness internally comes from God's spirit, the Holy Spirit infusing that in us by the word and teaching of God's word. He, he sows righteousness in our life sanctification or reconciliation of the truth in our life, then the callous good is what the Spirit of Christ then takes out of that and starts building things out of our life of goodness and relationships and our teaching and our interactions with things around our world around us. And he's saying, you guys, folk, I know they're not focused on the external. I know they're all veneer and fake. I know they're empty sepulchers and they're whitewashed tombs. I mean, we know they're hypocrites and liars. We know this. It isn't like our Lord and Savior wasn't around the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were the same way. All talk, no action. All words of, of anecdotes, of knowledge, but no depth of meaning. We, we've been there before. We know this rodeo. We've seen this song and dance before. Let them be. Notice how our Lord barely interacted with them. Given the whole three years of his ministry, he had very little, had very little interaction with them. You do the same, but don't let them discourage you. Because what does that mean? Because they're going to irritate you. They're going to they're gonna chide you. They're going to insult you. They're going to lord over you. They're going to do that stuff. Because it's easy for those who don't work to make fun of you who do work. Why are you tired? Why spend so much time? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? It's just, just ignore them. But in verse 14, he says, But if anyone obey not our word by this letter, point them out. That means to take a sign, take a note of them. In other words, you should always, in other words, if, if someone... In, our, in, our, in, our, in your fellowship, in your life of other people in Christ, you know people out there that are trying to exploit you. that are trying to take advantage of you. that are trying to uh, exploit the love of God, the love of His Word, the, your love for them. I, whatever you want to phrase it at. He's saying, call off what it, don't be ugly to them, but call them out for who they are. That, that's a person who is unfortunately struggling with their walk of faith, and, and I'm going to take the high road on this, and they're not putting in the work, and they want me to do it for them. And they want me to actually, like the foolish virgin parable, right? They said to the wise, give us of your own. We can't do that. Because you're, you're, that's your work to do. And not to that, not, they want to also then associate with me as if by imputing themselves, by associating with you or someone else, that they see as what they, where they want to be at. They want to impute themselves with you and say, see, we're one and the same. It doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean, now, if you're married, that's different. But if you're not married, you just can't be a friend to somebody and say, by the nature, his or her imputation of godliness or spiritual walk is imputed unto me. Because see, we're friends. No, that person's being nice to you. They're not your friend in that way you're talking about, but they want everybody to see them that way. You know, politics is played this way, right? You want to partner up and pal up with somebody, the old baby kissing photo op, right? To make it look like you care about the little, little peoples. When actually you don't, right? You could be a person who hates kids, but one photo with you kissing a baby, all of a sudden they think you're the best person ever, right? It's the same thing here. It's a posturing. It's a narrative that people are pursuing, and he's saying stop and point them out for those who are doing those kind of things, trying to posture and put narratives out. Point them out for who they are. And do not associate with them. This word means to fellowship with, to mingle with. 
And this is where Vicky's point comes in about boys out hard when they're family, right? Because you can't really do that when they're family. You have to associate in some way because of your blood. The God, if that's the way that God brought you in this world, you have to have some connection. So, but he tells you that, well, his bottom line is the last point. So the whole reason he says do that is to do what? He said, so that they may be put to shame. They may be put to shame, which means have their back, have your back turned on them. When the Jewish people have someone come to Christ, other Old Testament Jew people, and the new in the new world that we're in now, the new modern world, these old school Jewish people, they have a funeral for you when you believe in Christ. And they'll turn their back on you. I'm sure you've seen Fiddler on the Roof. They don't it's not even it's true stuff, right? They turn their back on their family member if they profess Christ as their savior. They don't like that. The the old staunch Jewish people. I'm not saying all Jews, the old school Orthodox Jews do that. And so here he's talking about not turning their back on them physically, but He's saying, like he did in Titus, there's a scripture in Titus chapter 2, let me show you this, gives you some context, what he means, and answers that question about your family members. So in chapter 2 of Titus, I think this is the best way to understand what he talks about when he says to turn your back on them or to, or to point them out for who they are and, and make them feel shameful. He doesn't mean insult them. He means what he says in Titus chapter 2, and that same phrasing about being shamed is used. Look into verse 6, 7, and 8 of Titus chapter 2. He says, the younger men in like manner exhort to be prudent as to all things exhibiting themselves a pattern of good works. A pattern of good works, that is the word kalos again, external works, in the teaching, seriousness, un uncorruptible, un uncorrupted in the teaching, seriousness, sound speech, not to be condemned, so that he who is of the opposition may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say concerning us. That's what he means. When he means put them to shame and turn your back on them, he doesn't mean you and your arrogance say, well, you're just not a person of God who knows his word. Oh, my God, I can't stand to be around you. He doesn't mean that. He means that you're so loving, so giving, so willing to reconcile any given moment that they, they can't deny that. And there's no way you treat them that is indifferent. There's no way you treat them that is condescending. You're not, you're not shutting them off. You're not cutting them out. You're available, but you're putting parameters in place or boundaries in place. You have boundaries and parameters, but you always are available. And you're always living and acting and talking and speaking about them in the best way you possibly can, knowing that any given moment, God could turn the light bulb on and they could come to you. And if they do that and you're not doing that,